Yeah, if I could just ask the panelists to come down and uh, for the audience to, to ask their questions. Um, we have about 50 minutes, I think, for, for Q&A. And while you uh, guys sit down, uh, David Hammond asked me to convey his apologies. He um, actually had to leave for another cannabis event, um, so he can't, uh, he can't be here, unfortunately. But he's, uh, he's offered to answer any questions, and he's uh, willing to hear your, uh, you know, he's looking forward to hearing your comments. Feel free to email him. That's what he actually said. So, um, People are already starting to queue, and I don't know which side to start. And I'll start with... Uh, oh. Okay. Are those microphones working, though? Yeah. Yeah, so they'll ask their question. I don't know who was first. Yeah. 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 Shall we start with the longer queue, maybe? Or? Sure. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I guess my question is, is harm reduction, are harm reduction regimes completely value neutral? Is there any concern within the sector? Of where, where's the line between facilitation and harm reduction? Um, is it completely, like I said, non-judgmental, value neutral? Um, I, I really struggle with harm reduction. Um, and you guys are presenting it in a very highly favorable view. So I just, I'm wondering about, is there any space to say, don't do drugs? And I, I recognize, you know, don't, you know, just say no, that doesn't work. But, but you, you're, so I guess facilitation versus reducing the harm. That's my question. So the, is it value neutral? No, it's not value neutral. It has all kinds of uh, humanistic values, uh, autonomy related values. Uh, uh, and it's about informing people of the risks of, of, of all of the risks of everything associated with whatever their activity is. And so uh, in the sense that making people aware of the risks of using drugs is uh, uh, a part of harm reduction, and it is, um, you wouldn't be saying don't do drugs, but you would be saying, for example, you know, if you consume in this way, there are these risks, whereas if you consume in that way, there are those risks. Where it's value neutral is vis-a-vis -vis the underlying behavior, and so it doesn't say, for example, that it is bad or wrong or evil to consume uh, substances, to have uh, sex outside of marriage, um, you know, uh, which also are things that can often be associated with harms, as you know. Um, so it's value neutral in that sense, and in that sense there is not space for don't do. Um, but there is space, uh, there, no, there is space for if you're going to do, here's what you need to know. Which I think is, I mean, you're right, I present harm reduction in a favorable light because I I think that's good. I think it's actually more effective um, in reducing harms. And there's all kinds of evidence uh, in a number of different types of interventions that show that in many contexts, um, and particularly in the drug contexts, informing has been more effective than don't do. And you know, I mean, that's why we're in this position of legalization in the first place, is because don't do didn't do it. Great. But I, would, I think I would just add that mostly I find when people um, take issue with harm reduction, it's because it, it is unacceptable or they take issue with the idea that some people will use drugs, no matter what, in the world. We will never have a drug-free society, and the lengths at which we go and the costs associated with the lengths to which we go to stop people consuming are just unfeasible and inhumane. Um, and I think harm reduction is, it's options, it's non-judgmental. Sometimes harm reduction programs are coupled with recovery and abstinence when people want to and are ready for that. I mean, Insight does couple its harm reduction services with the availability of treatment and abstinence if someone wants it. But mandated treatment, mandated abstinence is, is unethical, it doesn't help, it violates conventions, um, and I think that's really where harm reduction is. It's accepting that some people will use drugs and meeting them where they're at. Okay, next question from up there. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. My name is Bryce Carby. 
Um, I don't necessarily have a, a question in particular, but um, in terms of policy, a lot of people are interested about policy, but I am actually an example of these policies. I've been given, uh, I've been convicted for possession of cannabis, also uh, trafficking. Um, so these policies are actually things that are going to have an impact on my life in the future and for right now. So um, in terms of cannabis policies, there needs to be more of um, a touch to community centers <clears throat> as a place to inform young individuals about uh, cannabis, the rules, the laws, um, and to uh, help them to better navigate um, the world um, instead of falling into certain pitfalls that um, are, um, so to say, uh, expedited by racial profiling, um, certain uh, minority issues. Um, all of these, I've been, uh, I could say a victim, but I'll choose and say that um, it's actually made me stronger uh, for the simple fact that instead of me taking it um, and you know feeling sorry for myself, I'm actually going to uh, use myself as, as an example to help younger uh, kids avoid the same pitfall that I fell through and um, to basically help them, you know, to get them the proper information and, um, you know, not to say don't do drugs, but do them responsibly or do them the ones that are good for you or, you know, um, like was being spoken, you know, opioid uh, abuse, you know, as a deterrent, as a, um, another option. Um, there's a lot of crises, you know, people deal with stresses. If marijuana was more, um, accepted, there would be a lot more, less depression, a lot less um, societal issues because people will take the time to actually think about issues instead of thinking about the financial aspect. You'll think about it, um, how can you actually help the person that's being in trouble, uh, that's being uh, convicted or actually uh, their lives are changing by these policies. So. Question. I don't know if it's a question or it's more of a, it's more of a statement kind of a thing. Do any so. of the panelists want to comment? Or? I would just uh, agree with the point about educating young people about this is part of what we talked about in terms of harm reduction, and I think it's not only about the the uh, substance itself, but the consequences associated with its. You know, I'm talking about the legalized aspects, uh, its possession, and and especially now with these uh, more punitive laws, uh, the trafficking of of the drug. And also, I've been given, um, with uh, the laws, the mandatory sentences, I would have fought the case in court, but uh, with the mandatory sentence, I would have spent between six to 12 months in jail. Um, so I chose uh, three years probation and 240 hours of community service. It doesn't mean that I'm guilty, it means that I took the better option. So if I'm in this position, then I know that there's a thousand, a million other people in the exact same predicament because they think that they won't be able to beat the case, they have to take a plea. So, yeah. Thanks. And just a word, I think people who are testifying like you are very important. We have to create more space to hear people who, are, who have been victims, victimized, or who have been in the, the network because of the prohibition before, and who will uh, be uh, sp important social actors in the future of this regulation. Yeah, my story is to be heard. Um, anybody can contact me if I'll be out and anybody wants to talk. We can definitely uh, talk about uh, setting up some programs. I'm currently working on a workshop to ad actually educate the youth about marijuana. So I look Thank forward you. to your interest. Harm reduction usually involves discussions of criminal law and health issues. We don't hear anything about poverty. We don't hear anything about family breakups and its effect on young children. We don't hear anything about intergroup relations. So why are we only restricting it to 
two or three issues instead of dealing with the thing in a broader context since it involves so many other aspects of society. Uh, you know, you should, right? So harm, what a harm reduction approach is supposed to do is it's supposed to take a person, an individual as a whole, uh, a, a complex person um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a real social environment with all of the difficulties and challenges that they face. And so in fact, uh, although I didn't speak about those things today, um, harm reduction often involves things like providing access to housing. That is a harm reduction measure. And it's often presented as such in conferences where uh, about harm reduction or in service organizations where harm reduction services are being provided where they say, okay, well, you know, if, you know it's, it started as a social movement in drug policy and in drug using, and not, or, or rather in, in drug using communities. No, but what um, I'm concerned and, about is the, we tend to emphasize the individual rather than, for example, the whole question of poverty and its connection as a social problem, not just an individual one. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think that, the, that, that, that in fact harm reduction activists fight for those types of social causes all the time, right? They'll, 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 they'll be active in anti-poverty initiatives uh, or in initiatives to provide access to housing not only on an individual basis but on, on a broader basis. Um, and it's something, because it's a, you know, maybe other people can add, but because it was a philosophy or a, 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 an approach that emerged in particular contexts, those contexts are the starting point, but there's ever more uh, pressure, interest to move exactly in the directions uh, that you're talking about. And if you go to a harm, if you go to the back to that, you know that really complicated slide that I put up full of all the things that get talked about at a harm reduction conference? Exactly those issues, anti-poverty activism and housing, are increasingly taking up more and more of that picture. And I, I, it should have been uh, uh, well presented uh, here. So I, I agree with you. Thank you. And I believe you're touching a very, very important point. We have the tendency to look at the, the substance. Here, cannabis. And we're afraid that at one point, uh, somebody could develop an addiction with the cannabis. But the variables you talked about are more important in the development of, a, of an addiction than the substance itself. I don't deny the importance of the substance itself, but the factors that you were talking about are very, very more important. And too many times, we are not looking at these factors uh, setting out our prevention programs. Thank you. I would just like to uh, point out when you were referring to the Manitoba and Quebec not allowing the production of cannabis, could that not be to continue to allow for entrance and uh, warrantless search based on smell? Could that not be the motive behind it? That you're going you're gonna to lose the right to go and boot in the door? Because that's, for my opinion, that's exactly what's behind this particular part of it is the right to go and kick in the door and jackboot the place, destroy everything, destroy people's lives. As far as cannabis use is concerned, I've been arrested and charged over four times. I've got three discharges, two absolute, one conditional, and one I paid a fine because I was traveling through Timmins, Ontario, and rather than go and fight it, I took a change of venue. I also find a, a, a Section 7 challenge, a charter challenge in Saskatchewan. At the end of that trial, I wasn't in the room, but I was in the hallway because I couldn't make it back in time for the trial. The judge wished he could have met me and thanked me personally for bringing these matters to the court's attention. So I think maybe harm reduction is the way that we'd better go. One other thing, in Fort McMurray, they refer to it as Fort Crack instead of Fort Mac because the construction workers with the drug testing have been forced now into a position where they're using meth, meth crystal meth, and crack cocaine. And I've seen too many of my brothers and sisters have their careers and families destroyed because of these drug testing laws. Thank you. Hello, my name is Amy. I'm a former high school teacher and a PhD candidate here at Faculty of Education. I also teach courses here for our futures teachers. Um, one thing I take away is the importance of educating public and youth, and obviously teachers for educating about whole so social, political 
and scientific context of it. But there's so many diverse voices that I'm hearing even from today's panel. Um, and I'm also, maybe you and I should also talk, me, um, we're creating educational program for youth to actually educate a whole this multifaceted um, top, topics about cannabis. I just wanna know as an expert, if you could just give one action plan that you would actually like to see an educational program for public school system, what would that be? I would direct you to a report recently released by the Canadian Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Have you seen that already? Okay. Um, and I would direct you just to sort of organizationally promote, but I, I do think it's a great program to um, read a little bit around um, our safety first materials um, and, and programs and, you know, Education is so context specific, so what works in New York, we still have to see whether it works in California, it might not work in, in Canada, but the idea behind it is education grounded, not in fear mongering, mythologi mythologizing, um, but harm reduction. And it's a multi-week course with students in, in high school and public high schools mm -hmm. that goes, what I like about it, it is it goes not only into substances and potential risks around substances itself, but also drug policy and puts it in a historical, political, contextual experiences. And it's, it's very much a conversation with students. Um, and we're just conducting the evaluation right now. So, you know, it's not, I can't call it yet evidence-based or scientific, but I think moving towards programs that are grounded in, in those philosophies of, of you know, health and, and harm reduction similar to non-abstinence-based sex education and honest sex education. There's a lot of lessons to draw from that. Um, and it would be great to, to see other schools in different countries doing something similar. Okay, so join me in thanking our, all of the panelists for their terrific talks. <laughs> and thank you.